everyone, this is Al McKay. This is episode 38. I'm interviewing Delcio Gomez from Industrial Light and Magic, talking about Avengers and lots of other cool stuff. Let's dive in. Welcome to the Alan McKay Podcast. Alan is an Emmy Award-winning visual effects artist and mentor to many leading industry experts. Listen in as Alan talks with other industry leaders in film, video games, and visual effects about their experience, lessons, and methodology. Alan will teach you pivotal advice to fast-track your career, better your skills, and reach your ultimate dream job. Check out the latest episodes on alanmckay.com. All right, I'll make this short and sweet. This episode is going to be a lot of fun. I'm interviewing a good friend of mine who works in the, as a uh, generalist, I should say, I was going to say the Digimat department, but they've been kind of repurposed in the last two years, I'd say, at Industrial Light and Magic. Um, Delcio has worked on a lot of really cool projects from Oblivion through to Avengers, currently just wrapped on the new Terminator film, as well as a lot of other projects and super talented guy from Brazil and we talk about a lot about what it takes to get into a place like ILM as well as just more in general how to kind of build your career how to break into the industry uh, a lot of really really cool stuff a lot of fun um, a couple of things I was mentioning industry drinks were last week and that was in LA that was a lot of fun getting to meet a lot of people that I hadn't actually met before as well as a lot of friends of mine from DD and a few other uh, studios came along, uh, Activision, a lot of beer and good times. I unfortunately had to duck out kind of early, uh, unfortunately, but next month we'll be doing it all over again. So if you want to check that out, just go to alamckay.com slash drinks. And finally, this month, June is our first real review. So this is going to be really cool. I'm teaming up with Todd Sheridan Perry, who is a Emmy Award winner, who worked on Lord of the Rings, has worked at Weta, uh, a lot of other big studios, really talented guy who is a visual effects supervisor and typically reviews a lot of people's reels. Uh, I'll be teaming up with him and the two of us together will be going through a lot of submitted reels and reviewing everyone's work giving feedback and just uh, talking one-on-one -on -one with a lot of people and giving a lot of advice for them. So whether you're new to the industry or whether you just want to kind of polish up in your work, um, either way, uh, it's going to be a lot of fun. And even if you don't have anything to show, uh, I think it'd be great to join. I think there's a lot of great information you can take just from observing. So feel free to come on as a spectator and check it out. So if you go to alanmckay.com slash real review, so that's R-E-E-L review.com. Uh, sorry, not .com, real review. And I'm actually going to be putting up a domain uh, pretty soon for that, but I'll announce that on the next episode. So that is the other thing I wanted to mention is that in episode 39, which will be out next week, I'll be interviewing Alf Martin Lavold, who is the creator of a new short film that just came out publicly today, which is Dawn of the Planet of the Zombies and the Killer Plants on Some Serious Acid. Um, so obviously a bit of a, a pun and parody, but this is a really brilliantly put together kind of uh, short film or um, trailer, I guess. But uh, it's something that he put together pretty much by himself over the past six or seven months. It just came out today. Uh, I'll put a link to this in the uh, notes if you want to check it out. So if you go to alamckay.com slash 38, so 38, the numbers, um, you can check it out there. And I'll be interviewing him next episode. Um, I came across this a few weeks ago and I just saw a few like, kind of work in progress um, versions of it. It looked amazing. And so I kind of been chatting to him a lot about this, just kind of really interested in seeing how this goes because it looks amazing. And I think that this is going to be uh, something very, very popular on the web for sure. And uh, yeah, so I will follow up with that. I've got a few really awesome interviews coming up as well as a few other really cool announcements. So lots more to come. Uh, in the meantime, let's get into this episode. Hey everyone, this is Alan McKay. I'm here with Delcio Gomez, who's a good buddy of mine, who's worked uh, both in Brazil as, as well as uh, more recently, the last couple of years, he's been working over in the States on a lot of really big projects. I'll let you, Delcio, do a bit of name dropping, but um, do you want to give a bit of a quick intro as to some of the stuff you've done? Um, yeah, sure. I worked on, uh, you, you want to know about the work or you want to know 
what I've worked on. <laughs> I well, worked okay. on, well, okay, most recent I work on Terminator Genesis, which is not out yet. I mm-hmm. worked on Avengers, the Age of Ultron, and I uh, worked on Halo with you. Um, mm-hmm. And what else? A couple other projects. Thor. Um, I've got your Thor, MVP in yeah, front Thor, of me. Thor, the so. Dark Work. I'm if cheating. You, <laughs> search my name. Uh, <laughs> search my name on you know on Google. And Oblivion, you're find After everything Earth, Beautiful work. Creatures, yeah. Prisoners. You yeah. have my you have my file open. Yeah, That's, I told you I'm cheating. I've got your IMDb oh, right man. in front of me. <laughs> <laughs> I actually forgot you're on Halo because it isn't on here. <laughs> oh yeah. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I mean, what's your background? Because I, I know at least initially when I first met you, you were more modeling. But I know the last time we worked together, um, you were definitely doing. Uh, more lighting and more generalist stuff too. So you're kind of transitioning, I guess, more yeah. into that role. Yeah, Blair was a scene assembly, right? Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, so I'm Brazilian and in Brazil, it's very rare that you're going to see an artist that is just s- s- working specifically in one, t- one thing. So in Brazil, I was doing a little bit of everything. I was modeling, I was texturing, I was shading, I was animating, I was doing everything. And... Yeah, to to start in the industry in the United States, I did have to like be specialized in one thing, and that was modeling, um, especially hard surface. And it was an easy transition. Why it was actually on Pixelmondo, I started like getting more into texture, and then shading, and then lighting, and then at Blur I was doing everything. And now I'm back to be just a generalist, doing a little bit of everything. But so, uh, I'll just cut you off for a second to say that like um, ILM's version of a generalist though is a bit different though because it's more like originally the um, you you do like uh, God I'm drawing a blank at the moment it's been a rough weekend um, but like ba- basically like the the there's a new version of generalist now whereas before uh-huh. it was more you know you'd have the mat department and kind of it would kind of shift over into doing a lot of 3D like especially 3ds Max stuff like that would be it would all kind of fit into that category. So mm-hmm. I think it's more recently been kind of redefined. Yeah. Um, how can I explain? I'm not like, I've been there for like eight, eight months now. So I don't mm-hmm. know if I can speak for the department, but um, the generous group in ILM uh, transitioned from the Digimat department, which was yep. matte painting and, you know, those cool uh, paintings on glass, but um, then when they transitioned to the digital area, um, era, um, it became more like digital environments, and nowadays we're doing shots. So like basically, we're doing a lot of stuff outside of the regular pipeline of ILM. So they have their regular pipeline where they run like Hulk and Iron Man and stuff like that, and we, we can use softwares out of the box. So yeah, we are using 3D 3D Max and V-Ray, but there are also people using Clarice. We're using anything that we can use outside the box to make the shot work. You know yeah. what I mean? And it's way so, more cost effective that way than uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So and especially like some some shots, instead of having to hand something to a model and the model had to do with the texture artist and the lighter, um, I'm actually doing all of this and cutting the cost. You know, mm-hmm. um, of course I can't do that for like Hulk. But for some environments, it's actually more yeah. re- reliable this way. You know? Whatever it takes, you know? Yeah. Yeah, that's cool. And um, I'm just kind of curious, actually. Um, so, I mean, you started from, like, initially, let's just say, being a generalist, but then you decided to define yourself as um, modeling initially to, you know, mm-hmm. especially just transitioning over here, and then you kind of grow out of that again. And I'm just curious, kind of curious about this because I, I had like an industry drinks thing, which you've got to come down for one of these. But I had one right. um, last uh, Friday and it was, it was kind of interesting talking to a few people who are modelers. And I've always got this opinion that like, you know, I definitely think that when you're trying to get your foot in the door, it's definitely good to kind of pick something that's in high demand and low supply. But at the same mm-hmm. time, like modeling something that, you know, no matter what, it's a big necessity. Like if you take on rigging as a job, I think it's kind of shooting yourself in the foot a little bit because typically that's something that you'll come into the production, you're going to be around for a little bit and then you kind of taper off. Whereas like modeling, lighting, animation, stuff like that, you're going to be needed throughout the whole production. But mm-hmm. um, at the same time, like I think modeling is definitely one of those things, especially now that 
and I, I'm curious about your opinion about how kind of oversaturated it might be just because unfortunately, you know, there are so many talented people out there and it, especially with ZBrush and everything else these days, it's made it very easy to do both hard surface and organic modeling. So I kind of feel like the competition's a little bit steeper than probably any other areas in 3D just because, you know, there not, are so not many. Only, not only that, but also like scan data, right? You have like, yep, yep. Sc- just the scan data by itself, it helps you a lot. It like, it gives you like, but I, I guess like most of modeling is now are if you don't have the skin data is mod like something that is completely um completely imaginated, right? It's mm-hmm. something that doesn't really exist in real life. But I agree and a lot of stuff has been already. So we do buy like depending on like the model of a car, it's it's way easier to just buy the model than actually, you know, pay one model to model everything. Yep. Um, yeah, um, that's why usually I actually tell people, if you want to be a modeler, try to at least understand other, other things too. Like try to learn a little bit of texture, try to learn a little bit of animation. You might fall in love with another area, Mm -hmm. um, or at least it's going to help you to become a better modeler, you know? Exactly. Um, So, yeah. I and also, like also if there's any like downtime, then you know, yeah. when they when they start saying, okay, well, we're waiting for the next big project, we got to start laying people off. You mm-hmm. know, if they say, you know, Alan or Delcio, like, can you also light? And you're like, yeah, I can. It's like, okay, great. Well, we'll get you to do some more stuff. But if you're like, no, all I can do is this one thing, then mm-hmm. um, you know, it's a lot harder for them to be able to place you. So, the yeah, yeah. I I definitely think you know having that core and- foundation in 3D is important and i I also just want to put out there that is there there is a big difference between sculpting and modeling for production there is a big difference between like when you model uh something for concepting like you're trying to put out ideas and like approve a character or something like that that's a totally different thing than actually in production when you're modeling something you need to worry about topology you need to worry about your uvs you know and uh, I just I just want to put that out there because a lot of people approach me uh, with nice sculptures from ZBrush, but um, you know you need to learn you need to know a little bit of the other side like how to effectively put that into production. You know, I, you know Alessandro, Alessandro. Yeah, 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 yeah. I remember I saw him talking um, last year in Portugal, and he said like if they gave me a task of twenty days. Uh, probably five days are going to spend like actually sculpting. The rest is like fixing topology, making sure that the animation is fluid, you know? Mm. Um, so yeah. I think that's very important for people who are starting. You know? that, that's a really good point, actually, because at the same time, like when, let's say you're doing organic modeling, you need to take into consideration that this character is going to be deforming. And so, mm-hmm. you know, you've got to put in a lot more work into like the shoulder, into the pelvis, into areas that are going to deform a lot because you might give it to an animator and they're going to say, you know, you didn't give enough geo in that area. And now we're getting like these hard pops and everything in the model. And yeah. that sort of thing come up, comes up a lot. And again, the more experience you have, the more you'll understand like um, yeah. what to expect. But yeah, you know, unfortunately, it's, a, it's something that you learn in the job. You you learn after. I usually say that no matter how much tutorials you do, how much school you go, um, your first job is gonna be where you're gonna learn a lot. You know, so yeah, absolutely, yeah, yeah. Even like even uh, along the way, I think there's definitely studios you go to that um, you know you make these massive strides. And for me, you know, I remember the first big studio I ever worked for. Um, you know, I felt like I pretty much threw away everything I knew in the first two mm-hmm. weeks of being there just because you suddenly surround yourself with all these people that uh, are able to help you grow and kind of teach you, you know, their 20 years or 10 years of experience and it kind of really grows on you. And mm-hmm. yeah, I mean, for you, like, let's say transitioning into more lighting and being a generalist, and I know like you came from being a generalist, but let's say Blur or somewhere like that where you kind of get introduced to like a, a big studio pipeline like that um what was that experience like for you to kind of um you know follow their method or their approach to doing all that kind of stuff um it was 
Um, yeah, because you say Blur is a big studio, but now that I'm on <laughs> ILM, yeah. it's uh, yeah, it's very different, you know. Um, I feel like it's more of a big garage, you know what I mean? Yeah, it, yeah. it, it does have like, um, you know, they have a lot of tools and a lot of methods of how they work and stuff. Um, they are really good at like teaching that, so you learn pretty quick. Um, but again, I guess like once you learn um, the basics and the foundations of stuff, on applying this and like the rules that that company used, you know, for applying this mm -hmm. is something that you, you get on the jobs. Like, you know, two, three weeks, you're going to be doing great, uh, great work, you know? Mm -hmm. um, yeah. It's just like, you need to learn, you know, the foundation and that that's the tricky part, you know? And um, because I came from Brazil, like, um, and um, I don't want to, I don't know if you want to go to like, Brazil and how I started and stuff like that. I would but, love to go to Brazil. Uh, <laughs> man, man, you would love Brazil. People there would love you. We, but, we talk about it a lot. We, we need to go at some point. Uh, yeah, just don't go on Carnival. You're going to be overall. Like, it's <laughs> just too much, you know, too much drinking for you. Yeah, yeah. But, we'll, um, we'll see about that. I, I just realized, like, I, I think I already knew this and I'm sure we've talked about it, but you're four days older than me. Am I? Yeah. Because I'm May oh. 1st and you're um, May 26th, is it? Or I've lost it again. But I noticed that um, earlier that, yeah, you're, um, yeah, like the same year and everything. That's why we get along so well. That's right. Right? <laughs> um, but actually, yeah, I mean, if you do want to jump into that, um, yeah, I mean, yeah, I'd love to know like how you got started and your experiences yeah, there. Yeah, because the reason I was like, mentioned in Brazil is because um, it all started like that. Like uh, um, back in the day, um, I was working in Brazil. You want the full story or you want just a resume version? It was a cloudy day when, when I was born. <laughs> when my dad was born. <laughs> Too um, much cachaça. I can't even say it. I still have that bottle, by the way. I've, I've been holding on to it, waiting for us to drink it together. Okay. Okay. Cachaça. I said yeah. it. Okay. Yeah. Cachaça. But... Um, <laughs> Yeah, so I studied graphic design in Brazil. Uh, back then, there was no, like, you know, now I know that there is, like, animation and courses, like, for CG and for this area, but at that time, there wasn't. Mm -hmm. So it was, like, I either go to architecture or design, graphic design. And in graphic design, I started learning animation, and that's how I got my first trainee, um, trainee job. And it was a small, then that's why... When you say small, blur is small, like you need to see the companies in Brazil, man. We're just like, oh, it's five in a room and that was a company, you know? Yeah, Australia, at least, you know, when I was there, was the same way. Like, um, yeah. I, think, I think they're very similar in that respect. And, you know, I, I went there, started learning. At the time, it was 3D Max, yeah. I was on uh, 3D Max 2007, I guess, or 2008 or something like that. Mm -hmm. Um. Yeah, and I was learning that, and um, it was mentoring at the time. And, um, you know, it was good because I was learning all the foundations. Um, you know, I was going out and taking photos. I was understanding how light behaved, you know. And I actually had, like, really good teachers at the time. Um, I like to say that I'm from the third generation of Brazilians who come to U.S. to work on VFX. <laughs> um, I don't know if you know him, but Chris Costa... Um, Rings a bell. Yeah. I have a feeling maybe because yeah. of user. But Chris Cross sure. is another Brazilian who works at ILM right now. He's a creature model. Mm -hmm. And um, he was the pioneer, like one of the pioneers. He actually created what is CG society, uh, a version of CG society in Brazil. And that was how I first started learning in Brazil. Right. Um, but because everything was in Portuguese and most of the cool stuff is actually in English and I couldn't speak English, I decided to do an English um, course. I, I, um, it's like a program that you come to the U.S. and you learn, you, while you're learning, you also work. And uh, because most of the, you know, it's very frustrating when you want to learn, when you want to learn a new software, what you usually do is go to the help, right? Right. But if the help is in another language, it's very complicated for you to understand, right? Yeah. So, 
And you don't want to depend on someone who's going to translate that for you. You want to get from the source, right? Yeah, I'll, I'll just say that I've had a lot of people um, want to translate a lot of the work that I've done to other languages. And mm -hmm. that's the thing is, you know, especially if they, let's say they don't do what I do, then I would even feel more uncomfortable if I were to say, okay, let's translate like a lesson I did from English to Portuguese. And they're like, yeah, you click the grid and move the sphere to the 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 point uh, you know and it doesn't make sense but the yeah. at least if they know the 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 tools it's one thing but it's still yeah you kind of want to say okay well give me two years I'm gonna learn really bad Portuguese and then I'm gonna <laughs> try yeah, and do it and, myself and especially nowadays right it's not just about the video the tutorial it's about like the comment comments and participating on the forum or like mm -hmm. sending emails and asking questions right yeah. you want to be able to do that and uh, language is the first barrier you know. You need to, um, you're, you're lucky because Australian, English is your native language. I know that you're an immigrant like me, but <laughs> um, yeah, it's the first, you know, uh, issue right there. Yeah, I mean, it's language. a huge one too. Yeah, so once you, once you pass this barrier, and then, then you equal, you know. Um, so you, so yeah. you did the course, uh, sorry to cut you off, but you did that over here in the US? Yeah, so yeah. Um, I learned the basics Basics I learned in high school, um, but then I, I, I joined this um, program that you come to US. I came to California. I was working on a team park um, and going to community college, which I abandoned because I realized that I was just studying with people who had the same level of English. I actually wanted to just go out and talk to people. You know? Yeah, I think, fully immerse I think yourself. Yeah, I think already you already realized that I like to talk a lot. <laughs> so um, that's actually how I develop, you know, the skill. Like I, I learned English doing that. You know? That's good. That's the best way, you know. And and also, uh, it was actually an accident that I came to California. Um, I you know pick a place and I pick California because I I like the beaches and the girls and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. But um, it was actually really good because you know I managed to go to my first sea graph. Uh, Norman was like really close to the place that I used to live, you know. So it actually helped a lot that when I first came to US, I was actually in the middle of you know the VFX, you know. Um, yeah, the heart of it all. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, that's cool. So yeah, I worked a couple of years in Brazil. I came to US. I learned English. Then I went back to Brazil. Um, I work mostly in advertisement, um, a lot of printing, um, printing for magazines, for, you know, um, um, you know, uh, how do you say, outdoors and stuff like that. Yeah. Um, I work for L'Oreal, I work for Coca-Cola, I work for like really big um, uh, companies, um, but I always wanted to work with movies, you know. Um, of course. And so, one thing, uh, I'll just cut you off, but like... Um one thing I remember when I first met you, we were always talking about was that, you know, coming from Brazil where you had, you know, people knew you there and you, you had a client base, but then coming here, obviously it's, it's hard to kind of reestablish yourself in another country because obviously um, you've got to essentially build that clientele again and kind of prove that you can do the work, which is obviously difficult to, to do when you're starting from scratch. Mm -hmm. Um. Yeah, I, I had to start from scratch a couple of times, right? So when I first came to the U.S., I came back, I had to restart my career because I was out for like a year and a half. Mm -hmm. um, also, when I was in Brazil, I got to a point where I have a really good client, like clients and, and then I decided to come get a bigger fish in the United States. So um, at the time, so like just to put in context, at the time there was a big company um, – called Seagulls Fly in Brazil, which unfortunately is not around anymore. They closed. Um, but it was like probably one of the biggest companies in Brazil. Mm -hmm. And they came to West, they came to LA, um, and they were getting a lot of clients in LA. So I was part of another company in Brazil who decided to do the same strategy. And because I had experience in the United States, they sent me here, you know. So I came to US again, representing that company in Brazil. Cool. Yeah, that's good. And so, yeah, I mean, so I guess your first feature film when you kind of made the transition to that was Beautiful Creatures. Is that right? 
Yeah. yeah. So yeah, after that, yeah, like jumping in time, I yeah, I I decided to make the move from Advertise. I wasn't very happy with Advertise. It wasn't like challenging me anymore. So I decided to make the change to VFX. Mm-hmm. And um, of course, nobody knew me here. I I it was a young guy here, so I had to like. I applied to a bunch of places and, and you know, Pixel Monde at the time, they were opening their new um, branch in Baton Rouge and they're like, hey, you want to go there and like, you know, work there? I'm like, sure. So, yeah, I moved to Baton Rouge and stayed there for nine, nine months and that was my breaking into the industry. And that's yeah. going to be pretty difficult too because uh, for anyone who doesn't know, like, you're obviously married. So, like having, yeah. um, you know, that, that that's definitely one thing I guess uh, it is worthwhile mentioning is like, we all kind of make those sacrifices where you've got to kind of chase the work, at least initially when in your case, you've already built a career, but you've got to reestablish yourself here. And so having to travel and work in a different city, I mean, that sort of stuff's going to be pretty brutal to, um, to go through, but yeah. yeah. Um, yeah, it was tough. Um, we, we talked a lot and, um, we thought it would be a good, um, over, over time would be the best thing to do and mm. and, and we were right you know and uh yeah i went to Baton rouge and um stay away but it also was really good because i was focused you know yeah i i was i went to Baton rouge it was a good opportunity for me because uh, unfortunately most of the people who went to Baton rouge um and i i don't want to sound yeah i'm i'm choosing my words very careful right now but um you know if you're working in LA and you need to move to Baton Rouge, there is a, um, you know, why you're moving to Baton Rouge, right? So like, there is a lot of students who goes there, a lot of people starting careers, and I already had a lot of experience. So when I went to Baton Rouge, it was easy to me to stand out, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. So it was easy for me to get more responsibility and and stand like show. Sh- Show off. Like, I don't want to say show off, but like, um, essentially, you you've got a lot more experience, so it's it's something that you're going to stand out of the crowd because you're yeah. You know, there's a lot of people. Yeah. It was their first project, and so it it definitely was a big selling point to a lot of people. It's like, hey, you get a chance to work on a feature film, but it's going to be in a place that's definitely more tax incentive driven. So come down to like near New Orleans around there and come work remotely. And a lot of people were doing it because for them it was like a big career move. Whereas with you, you've got like the extensive amount of experience, but um, you're doing it more to kind of reestablish that, you know, flag in the ground in the U S and, and it was good because at the same time, I, I knew a lot of CG stuff, but it's always a transition, right? Like mm. I remember the first time that someone told me like, Oh yeah, you need to put that to a plate. And I, what the hell is a plate, you know? <laughs> I eat off a plate. Yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, yeah, and that, that was also also really cool because it was the first time that I met Alan, right? <laughs> well, it's funny that you say, like, um, you know, people come down there typically to get their career, you know, going or whatever. And with me, it was more, I was dating someone. I just figured it would be like a, yeah. a free flight. So why not go down there and Yeah, do that's some work? why I was choosing my words because I don't want to sound like everybody's like that. Of course... Sometimes you get a very high pay incentive to go down there, and some people went there. Um, but mostly, I would say, is like a lot of junior artists starts mm. in Baton Rouge, you know. And um, once I finished that project in Baton Rouge, I went back to LA and Pixel Mondo called me again and, like, hey, you did a good job in Baton Rouge. We want you to come in and work in the LA office. So, yeah. And and that was the start, you know, for VFX. So with Oblivion, like, what were the main things you did on that? Um, it was more like in the outside shuttle, um, you know, when Tom Cruise is out of the space, um, mm-hmm. and it was kind of like just replacing green screen. It was very um, Oblivion was a very simple thing. It was just like a week or so. It was very quick. Sure. And then from there, you moved on to working on After Earth? After Earth, yeah. I worked on a, on a big ride, a Wanda ride on Pixel Mondo. Yeah. So, yeah, so you worked on After Earth. And then um, I'm kind of curious, though, like you worked on Prisoners. And, you know, I kind of imagine that oh, not, yeah, yeah. not being a very VFX-driven I, film. 
I went to I went to Luma after Pixelmodo. I, I I went to Luma for a little bit. I worked on Thor, and in the middle, I think in between Thor and another commercial that we were working, there was um, so it was just replacing a piece of glass. There was a piece of glass in the hand of the actor. Mm-hmm. Uh, of course, it's too dangerous to have a piece of glass, and they are fighting and stuff. Yeah. So we were replacing that pretty much. Um, yeah. Okay, cool. Yeah. yeah, I was just curious. I mean, it's kind of like Walking Dead. Um, you yeah. know, these it's very, yeah. Sorry, no, this is, uh, is the invisible, invisible magic, right? We do a lot of shots that people don't even realize it's there. You know? Yeah. Well, it's good, though. I mean, you know, it's a, it's a necessity. But um, no, that's cool. And I, I guess I am kind of going through your whole, you know, uh, work history at the moment. But, I mean, <laughs> I, I guess at that point, like, you went to Blur and... Yeah, Halo, so, Halo was a pretty interesting project. I mean, for a lot of reasons, but um, especially because I re reunited with you. <laughs> yeah. First, first day I was sitting by you. Yeah, I was like, wow, what a surprise! <laughs> I, I, I'm actually going to try and see if I can find. Um, I think there's photos of us in Baton Rouge uh, doing our Wasabi showdown, where we literally got like, I don't know, it was like six centimeters square of each of uh, Wasabi, like a big chunk. Anyway, <laughs> and you lost, but yeah, I, I lost. <laughs> for, for anyone who doesn't know, you're you're a big guy too, which um, I find hilarious because like you're the kind of person that if you sit at a computer, just because I don't know what are you like six four or something? You're I'm six three, yeah. Yeah, and um, yeah, like you kind of make it looks like you're gonna break a mouse if you go to like touch the. Um, <laughs> Yeah, I mean, no. Everybody who knows me, uh, I look a little scary, but no, I'm I'm soft inside. I'm very <laughs> mild. Yeah. Um. So yeah, you went to Blur. We ended up sitting next to each other, and then get all the lighters. I think uh, based on sequences in the right places. But uh, yeah, I mean, what was your experience like there? Because uh, I know that you really loved your experience there, and you're there yeah. quite late, quite often. Yeah, I I. Man, like I always wanted to work at Blur, you know. I've been following their work for a long time. Um, that first company that I worked in Brazil, um, the very first Consequences is the name. Um, Leo Santos was there uh, when I first started, and he was the first one to go from Brazil mm-hmm. to Blur, right? So he was the first Brazilian at yep. Blur. And I followed his, at the time, was like a blog or something. And uh, I always dreamed to work there, actually. Like, the people, you know, Team Miller is a character. Um, you know, I always wanted to be there. And I remember the first day I was like a fanboy, you know. Mm-hmm. Uh, it actually took me a, a little bit of time to like put down the fanboy and start to actually like put some work, you know. Um, but yeah, it's just the people are amazing, amazing artists. You don't have as much bureaucracy as some other companies you have. Um, there's a, I, I really like the, you know, stand up and go talk to him attitude that yeah. they have. Yeah. Um, and I don't know, man, I just had like a really good time there. It was, um, yeah, I, I love to. That's yeah. cool. That's cool. Like, who is, um, there's one of the guys who came in, uh, for Halo, blonde hair, short, spiky blonde hair. Um, I bumped into him, uh, the other night at the industry drinks actually. <laughs> um, he was just like random, like he was just at King's Head with a few of the blur, well, a few people like having drinks or whatever. But uh, yeah, He's blonde, uh, spiky hair. He was Is he American? He's American. Downstairs. He he was the guy who was running around uh, telling everyone like how I was on LinkedIn, um, that I was rated higher than Tim Miller and everyone else uh, on LinkedIn or whatever, and I was kind of saying like, Shh, don't, <laughs> I don't, I don't want people pe- pointing that out. Dirk, yeah, yeah, okay. that guy. Dirk. Uh, yeah, I bumped in him at King's Head. I so. think Dirk is not American, man. <laughs> oh, shit, you're right. I think he's from... <laughs> Netherlands. Yeah, I was going to say, yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> oh, God damn it. <laughs> I mean, yeah, that, that's, I hope, the, that's the thing. I, I, hope, have... I hope Dirk does at least do this. <laughs> um, you can never tell with him. Like, he's, uh, he sounds American to me, so... Uh, yeah. Yeah, so he's got no excuse. But I, I'm I know... working on my accent. I'll, I'll, I hope, hopefully I'll improve it and you're going to... That's right. I'm American too. <laughs> That's right. Um, so I, I noticed you're friends with Louis Calero. I, I noticed uh, both you got tagged on your Facebook wall. You know Louis, right? From Spain? Mm-hmm. Yeah. 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 We we go way, way, way back. He's um, yeah. Actually, when he first moved to the States, like he didn't speak English. 
and yeah. I and I used to hang out with him all the time. I'm I'm pretty sure like he's probably mentioned. <laughs> some... he, he actually have a funny story. Like, uh, yeah, Luis was a blur back. Like he came from Spain straight to blur, and now he's at ILM. And um, one of the big difference that I, I like. So okay, remember I told you I like to stand up and go talk to people. Mm-hmm. You can't really do that as often in ILM because it's just such it's a so, big company. Yeah, you need to walk all the way to another building and like talk to people, and it's hard to find anyway. So you end up using the phone a lot, right? Um, and man, I hate phones, you know, because mm-hmm. especially if I'm talking to someone who is from another country. Yeah, and and Louis is really hard to understand, man. Like <laughs> it's really, really hard to understand. Uh, so yeah, I have hard time communicating with them. But he's a, a great guy, you know. I, I I love him. Like um, I was always really protective over him. Um, I don't know why, but like when when he first moved to the states and like he didn't speak English and like we'd go out and he would always I don't know why, but he'd always get people pick on him. And, you know, the more drunk he got, also, like, all the bars would try and throw him out thinking, you're drunk. And it's like, no, he just, <laughs> he's Spanish. <laughs> yeah. So, um, I, I don't know. I've got so many stories about him because, like, I'm not sure if you know uh, Jaime Hasso. Um, yeah, I also know Yeah, him. so, he's so. Awesome. I, uh, I yeah, and uh, where was I? I was, I think I was in Mexico or somewhere. I, yeah, I was in Mexico City a few weeks back and um, I was telling a story about the two of them because, Jaime is from um, Guadalajara in Mexico, and he's he's a you know a smaller guy than Luis. Luis is I think six three as well, and um, yeah. he's really tall guy, really he friendly. Like a biker, right? He had like this big, bus, like uh, beard. Beard, beard yeah. yeah. Well, he's lost a lot of weight too, um, which yeah. is which is cool because he used to be a lot bigger, and um, yeah, now now he looks all pretty. Um, but yeah, it's just funny because Jaime is a small guy from Mexico, and like. For whatever reason, like he really picks on on Lewis, and uh, I don't know, it's just been really weird. Like if I hang out with the two of them, like Jaime will sit next to me, and he'll be really friendly to me, and he'll kind of like turn to to Lewis and like bark at him, like "Shut up!" blah blah blah. <laughs> and and you know, it's kind of one of these things where like, the dynamic between the two. Like I would say to Jaime, I'm sorry to uh, Lewis, because Lewis is just the nicest guy on the planet. I'm like, why do you, you know? You're you're a big guy. Like, why don't you stand up for yourself? And yeah. uh, you know, the the whole thing is that it's like, well, he's Spanish and I'm Mexican, and it's like, so what? So, um, you know, he'd always kind of call on the Spaniard, and he's like, you took over our country again. They're just completely <laughs> joking, you know. But I don't know. This the the whole dynamic between between the two of those guys is just really really funny. But I love them both. They're like super super cool guys. You need to come here, man. I, I I'm, come down here. I might because um, I'm trying to structure my year a bit at the moment to have a bit of time like me time for a bit so um mm-hmm. yeah i might actually do some traveling pretty soon and yeah going to san fran for a week or something might be fun so anything's possible <laughs> and um so that's really cool and like i guess um like i haven't seen you since you went to ilm so i mean what was yeah, it like been... moving to uh because you went to trojan the conference over in portugal Yes. And, yeah, it um, was a crazy month. Like I went from Blur. I finished my work at Blur. Um, I went to the conference. I spent like five days there and came back to San Francisco and started at ILM. Yeah. What was it's your crazy. first week like? Doing you know going from training and yeah, it's very it's very mild. The first week you're just like trying to set up your stuff, understand the tools, right? And like understand like the procedures, and you have like classes about like. Um, security and you know Mm -hmm. set up your message your your voice message um yeah it's very it's very like um you know a big company kind of feel you know yeah um the harder part is like san francisco is crazy right now about like renting and stuff that was that was uh, expensive or yeah yeah it's just crazy expensive man it's really hard to to live in the city right now it's like it's so impossible. you sold your house? Um, yeah, I so, I used <laughs> apartment in San Francisco. Yeah, but, I sold because financially it was the best time to sell. You sell right. when it's high, right? Yeah, but um, would have been yeah. handy to move back to San Fran and you know just walk yeah. back into your old place though. And now I'm waiting for the prices to go low again so I can buy again. So I'm leaving on rent right now. Mm-hmm. But, um, yeah, it was uh, it was tough. And my my wife was still in uh, LA. She moved now here, but. She was too late in the time, so it was very. Uh, but it was, 
it was I was excited because not only because of violin, but uh, you know I was working on Avengers, and I'm a, a big comic book you know guy. So yeah. So very- what was it like? I mean, you know, what were the main kind of contributions you made to uh, Avengers too? Um, so I I was working. I worked mostly on the end uh, of the movie mm-hmm. where. You watch the movie? Are yeah. we allowed to give spoilers of the movie? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's totally fine. Everyone on the planet seen Avengers 2. Okay. So in the end of the movie, there's this big city, Sokovia, who uh, rises into the sky. Mm-hmm. And I was involved into developing the, the asset and, you know, scene assembling that. Uh, not all the scenes, like a lot of shots. It's all divided, right? Some shots were doing here in San Francisco. Some shots were doing in Vancouver. But the asset, the bottom of the plug, I was kind of responsible for that, you know. Yeah. And it uh, was a big, it was quite a big responsibility. I wasn't expecting that, but it was fun. Like, now that I look back, it was fun. That's cool. And, like, how many shots do you think you turned out in however long you had on the project? Um, so, my shots, I did, like, 12 shots, I think. Uh, of course, there's, like, longer shots and very quick shots. Um but there is a lot of stuff that I, even though, like, it, people are even making fun of that. Like, the plug, the city was kind of like my baby. Mm-hmm. So even though, like, Vancouver was doing some stuff, I had to, like, deal with them and give them feedback or, like, passing them stuff. And, you know, it's kind of a, it was, it was a lot to do, man. You have no idea. <laughs> well, that's cool, though. And um, I don't Dealing know. Like- with creature dev, you know, a lot of, like simulation breaking buildings breaking rocks and like put that into our scene rendering that like it was what was the was, typical pipeline for doing something like that i mean obviously you know you're dealing with the effects guys who are doing all the simulation stuff but mm-hmm. what was so, yeah the sorry. simulation they were doing on um some some guys were doing Zeno, some guys were doing houdini mm-hmm. um and we were de- dealing the whole time with the lambic caches right um and yeah, I can't go into. I don't know if I get in trouble if I go into too much details. But yeah, we were so 3D Max. We would model stuff in 3D Max, pass down to like Houdini guys who would break it and make it look cool, like the simulations and stuff. And uh, and then I would bring it back the Olympic caches, uh, reapply the textures and stuff, light it and render. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Cool. So initially you would. You know, it's kind of like a boomerang. You initially do all the development, then you hand it over to them. They do their stuff, then you bring that stuff back into your shot. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. And uh, what was like the biggest challenges you found personally on Avengers? Um, the the bigger challenge, I think, it's funny because while I was working on Avengers, I thought there was a lot going on. The the caches. Once you're working on the CD and stuff, you have it under control. But once we pass by to the effects guy, the creature dev guys, and the guys were breaking everything, the size of the files were getting ginormous, right? So it was quite complicated to render. But I had, I had the same problem in Terminator, and I think it was even worse. Like I think I hit like, uh, I would say, 800 million polys in one scene. Wow. Yeah, and I had no idea Max could do that. Of course, <laughs> like a lot of reference, a lot of, yep. but yeah, it, in the farm, it actually loads everything. I was surprised that, you know. I was really actually, I was really jealous that you guys got to use Max because the whole time I was there, I used Xeno. And um, yeah, I don't know. I, I personally just never got into it. I could, uh, one of the, like Florian Schroeder, no, sorry, it's um, Weta, Florian Witzel. Um, he's, uh, I think, a CG super over there, but like, he was always like, Alan, like, you got to come back because what I don't know why, but like if you if you leave ILM and then you come back, Xeno just makes sense all of a sudden. <laughs> <laughs> so that was his theory. He's like, trust me, like I left and I came back and it all makes sense. And I'm like, I don't know. <laughs> so um, I don't know. Like it, it's it's definitely uh, one of those like love hate relationships for me. But um, yeah. but yeah, so, so you guys all got to use Max. And I, I was like, ah, if, if only. Yeah. But it, yeah, um, we use Max. There's a group of people now using Clarice that seems um, very promising. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, well, we use like anything that we can do the job faster, you know? Yeah, well, that's yeah. cool, man. And um, I don't know, like, 
for you kind of moving back there, I mean, do you think that's where you're going to stay for a long time or do you see yourself moving again? Um, I, I'm definitely learning a lot. I don't know because it's a big company. I think at some point I might go back to a smaller company. There's always like, I, there's, can I confess something? <laughs> sure, Every buddy. day, man, I wake up, I think about like letting, let it go, go back to Brazil and become a fisherman and have a good life, you know? Hey, I, I would join you. <laughs> yeah, just like, you know, simple job, just like a beautiful view every morning. But no, I, I, I do want to stay as much as I can in ILM. It's been like um, a great opportunity. I feel, I feel in, like lucky to be there. Mm -hmm. um, and it's funny because I, I work really hard throughout the years. I work really hard to get there, you know. And then you realize once you get there, you work even harder to stay there because there's so many bright minds there. There's so many good people that you can learn so much and you just want to, you know, yeah. learn more and work more. And yeah, it's a great place to be. I think it's a great environment to be in. Like, you know, any place that you can find that is like that where, you know, you leave your ego at the door because, I mean, everyone who's there obviously... You know, knows their shit. Yeah, so you know, you all go there. You all just do the best you can, and you know, you try and learn off of each other. And, um, yeah. that, and it, sorry, it, go ahead. Uh, it took me a while to get because, like, it was the first place I think that I went, and I would go to a dailies, and you know, we'd be sitting in the same room with John No, mm -hmm. and it's very overwhelming. At least it was for me. I was like, it's. You know, and then one day I realized I went to the restroom and I can't, <laughs> I'm, I'm not going to say his name, but you know, like you go to the restroom and you're like doing your business and he goes by your side and he's doing your business and then he accidentally do a little small part and you're like, realize that guy is also a human being, right? He's <laughs> also a human being. <laughs> I thought you were going to say Dennis Muren splashed you, but that's even better. <laughs> yeah. And and after that, I realized, okay, okay, I'm I'm cool. Everybody here, you know. <laughs> I'm sorry, but that's the best analogy ever. It's like, yeah, like somebody is a human being because they fought it next to you. <laughs> <laughs> that's it. <laughs> yeah. But uh, um, yeah, I'm not saying the name. You don't know who was. Um, <laughs> um yeah. Uh, no, that's that's great, man. Uh, I I don't know. I I will say like my last day there, I ended up um, hanging out with a lot of leads. Like we we're all it was our last evening together, and like we were all gonna you know going back to L.A. and um, we all got into a big discussion about the bathrooms at ILM, just because uh, obviously like it's it's very symmetrical building. So there's equal men's mm -hmm. bathrooms, equal women's bathrooms, and there are a lot of women that work there. But obviously, um, there's quite a lot of men, and you wouldn't think it, but like it ends up becoming a massive currency because like anywhere you go, you're not ever alone. Uh, mm -hmm. It's like several people in every men's room, and apparently, like you know, I guess I shouldn't get into this whole thing, but uh, I mentioned it once, and then like it became this big discussion because everyone had their opinion on this, which was that I didn't know, but everyone has like offsite bathrooms they go to depending on. <laughs> yeah, the, yeah. Uh, needs. Go to the sixth floor. But, Go to the sixth floor. Yeah, and then there's that. The... But but then that's a risk because like technically, uh, you know, 3D is not allowed on. You know, shouldn't be going to the sixth floor. And then um, one of the guys was mentioning he had this like secret bathroom, which even though he was it was his last day, he still wouldn't give up where it was. And then one day <laughs> he was going there, and no one else seemed to know about this secret bathroom in the building. And then. He goes there one time and Dennis Murin's walking out of there as he's walking in and there's this awkward look of like, oh, okay, we both know about this place. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't know. I, I can't believe that you could have like a 30 or 40 minute conversation about this, but we yeah. managed to. But <laughs> it's us, man. It, you know? Um, but yeah, um, it's, it's a big, big company, you know? And everything is different. Like the amount... Uh, I'm, you know, especially for me coming from Blur, where you know every Friday we would go out and have drinks every, mm -hmm. every like day or like you know a couple of days in a week we would go out and have lunch, you know, um, 
Yeah. It is a very like there's so many people and so many people in different schedules. Um, yeah, the social the social life there is not the same. You so, know? so you're saying you don't go to the final final every every day for me? I, I do, but not everybody. Because if the whole company goes to final final, <laughs> you know. But um, yeah, I, I you know me, I, I'll go. But. There's there's some good bars on Chestnut. Like I used to live. Um, yeah, it's the marina. Uh, yeah, well, I was gonna say like. I used, everyone would always say like, "Oh, where do you live in San Fran?" I'm like the marina. They're like, "Oh," and I'm like, "You don't understand. I work in the Presidio because like <laughs> I don't know what it is about the marina, but like everyone thinks it's really snobby." And the thing yeah. is that you walk around the marina, there's nothing to do, so I don't get why it always was so snobby. But um, yeah, I mean, a lot of douchebags around. I don't know. <laughs> um, yeah, so I used to live like right next to the Safeway there, which apparently was called Dateway because like it, people would get dressed up and do all their makeup just to go to the groceries because it was like one of the biggest places to meet people apparently mm -hmm. i never understood yeah. that but um yeah so i used to live like right off of chestnut and it was it's cool because there's a lot of good bars around there which i enjoyed obviously yeah and really <laughs> good food too but, yeah yeah so, but, uh, but um yeah it's just it's just tricky you know like sometimes in order to actually like get a group of people to go out it usually happens when someone is leaving or someone's birthday mm -hmm. but in the day to day a lot of people go to the commons area but it's yeah. not the same it's another feel you know it's a big company yeah. you have the big meetings you have the the theater is ginormous you know to accommodate everybody it's um yeah i the, i will say that about ilm like um for me i felt like it was the best employer i ever had in terms of um perks and everything else like I, I felt like you know even though it isn't a very personable company in terms of there isn't you know you you literally need to learn to ask people for help and to meet people mm -hmm. because it's kind of like daycare you just get dropped off and then it's like okay what do I do and mm -hmm. um, you've got to learn to actually go and like speak to people but uh, yeah. at the same time like that place there's so many perks they definitely make it enjoyable for family for friends and you know there's it, it a lot to it so I think that um you know, it's definitely enjoyable in that respect. No, yeah, and it's still, even though it's a big company, it's still a big company made um, from artists. I think most of the people high up there were artists before, and um, they really take care of you, you know? Like, I don't know if when you are there, uh, you were there a long time ago, right? Yeah, it was about five or six years ago, I think. Five, six years? Yeah. You have your, your, your manager, right? So, like, you have, like, um, a person that you can talk like it's, it's she's on your side so you can tell them whatever you want like hey this is not working i need this to and they will help you you know mm -hmm. they're on your side and on um, it, it's funny because some smaller company they don't have that you i worked in smaller companies that you could not have voice you know yeah and um yeah it, it makes you feel like even though it's a bigger company you do have voice you know it you do it's it's a bigger company there is like more emails, more meetings, more phone calls, but um, well, isn't that what ILM stands for? I love yeah, meetings. <laughs> I love meetings. <laughs> but um, but it works. They 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 manage to make like good work, and people there, even though they are very smart and very very talent, they they don't have ego. So like you can walk into a VFX you know artist that I'm big fan of their work, you know, and you just walk by and you like talk to them and they're going to be very receptive. It's, it's, mm -hmm. it's really cool. Yeah. yeah. That's great, man. It's really cool. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I don't know, like for you, like, I guess if you were to have like one or two like big key takeaways you've had so far, I mean, has there any, has there been anything you've kind of learned from being there? Like that? Is oh man, I learn every week. I, but what like, are some of the big things that for you have kind of been big game changers? Big game changers. Um, I guess. Let me see. I guess first, um, I had that impression that um, a bigger company like ILM, they would, um, they would never have. Uh, I think it, I was naive for thinking that they would not have like many alterations, and mm -hmm. that's not true. First they pass is final. Yeah. <laughs> no, yeah, I thought I thought it would be like you know the ideal, and it's not, and it's it's just like any other place, you know. It's just um, they manage to make it like things work quickly, you know. Mm -hmm. And I don't know, it's the same process. I don't know, it's it's little things that I learn over the, the 
over time, you know. I learned more about like 3D Max, like things on 3D Max that I didn't know. I learned, you know, like Alembic, for example. I never worked with Alembic before, you know. And it's a format that I think ILM developed with Sony, maybe. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, yeah, it was a big, like, big change for me, you know, like, a, like putting Alembic in my day-to-day -day work was something that I wasn't used to. Um, yeah, and working with a phone. I, I, I <laughs> use the phone a lot every day. I had to learn how to use it. And now yeah. I'm comfortable with it, actually. It's kind of weird because, like, yeah, you will talk to people that um, you'll never actually ever meet. You know, you, mm -hmm. you'll have, like, daily conversations, but you'll never actually meet in person with them. You're always just on mm -hmm. the phone. And it's those, because, like, a lot of people, like, ask me sometimes, oh, as an artist, and they are really focused on their artwork, right? But there is all this other stuff around an artist as a profession like a, as a profession you need to be good at like responding emails you know you need to be um, proactive you know and, and be like hey yeah sure I'll do that and participating and um, there's all other you know communicating and being part of like if you go in a meeting try to like put your input in a meeting you know and not just be like they're passive and just watching everybody talking right mm -hmm. Um, there's all those things that helps you as an artist too, right? It's not just like working, working, working on like, you know. Yeah, I completely agree. I mean, I I honestly think that that's probably the biggest Achilles heel that most artists have is that uh, they don't really think about the, you know, the 360 degree, you know, part of like managing themselves. They think, okay, I just got to go in and do my 3D work and I don't need to worry about anything else. And I think things like communication is probably, that's probably the biggest skill. If I were to say, if you, no matter what you do um, in, the, in any industry, uh, communication is by far the biggest thing to have. And like if you want to get noticed, if you want to stand out, if you want to be successful at what you do, you need to learn to communicate. You need to be able to learn to listen as well. But mm -hmm. um, I don't know, like that I think is such a valid thing, what you just said, like how how have you learned or like what do you think is some of the things that people do neglect that they they should have in their day-to-day -day, like um, skill set of uh being a an artist and working in this industry I, I don't know man like i've received a lot of emails i've been receiving especially like after you mentioned my name in one of the podcasts i've started receiving a lot of emails and i see a lot of like demo reels for example and you know even though the art the art on the demo reel the the, the piece it looks amazing it's not well presented Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and everything go like we evaluate when you're hiring people. We we evaluate everything, right? Like if you think about it, we spend more time at work. I spend like forty hours a week, and that's like the regular. But I was spending like seventy seventy five hours a week at work, and that's way more time that I spend with my coworkers than I spend with my wife most of the, most of the week, right? Mm -hmm. So you want to work with people that you like, right? So you need to be kind of likable. I don't, or maybe I need to say, you, uh, you can't be an asshole. You, okay. need to be, you need to be nice to people, you need to know how to deal with people, right? Um, and also you need to be good at communicating, you need to be able to email, um, when you write email to explain, if you're having a problem, explain your problem, right? Mm -hmm. um, and um, those, like, I don't know, man, it's just, it's not just the work, you know, it's a lot of other stuff, like how you present your work, how you present yourself. A lot of people like, you know, I, I tell people to have their uh, elevator pitch, you know, ready like if you need to introduce yourself to someone yep. introduce very quickly like hi i'm delcio i'm a journalist i work at ilm blah, and have that like in your system right yeah and and that's um, I, I was cut off uh, for a second to say that like um i think that's something that most people neglect and it actually takes a bit of work it's not like okay i'll just spend 30 seconds and figure this out but like <clears throat> you really do need to kind of stop and think okay if i were to condense down and present myself in the best light possible to make it really clear who I am, what I do and make myself memorable, like how would I say that? What, how mm -hmm. would make be the most impactful thing to say? And if you do that, it's night and day different because instead of them being like, oh yeah, you're that special effects person who does something or other, it's like, oh yeah, you're that person who does, like sculpted all that stuff for 
Avengers and did all this cool stuff at the end, that's amazing. Like they'll mm -hmm. remember you and they'll know also if you're talking to people, they'll know how to place you in their in their head in terms of like, wow, we actually need one of those at our company. Let's bring you in. Rather than, okay, you do 3D, I don't know what area or what, you're able to paint the picture and help guide them as to how to um position you in their mind. It's very, very important. Yeah, I agree a hundred percent. And it's you know, it's so sad sometimes we used to go to like uh, lunch, you know, me and you, and I saw artists like wasting their time talking about is Maya better than Max? Is mm -hmm. Max better than Maya? And that's for me, it's just a waste of time. That you know, it's just a waste of time. It's just a tool, right? Yeah. I I think it's way more productive when we're talking about like LinkedIn, for example. I, by the way, I think it's interesting to say to put out there that I would not be in ILM if it wasn't LinkedIn. I got approached by LinkedIn. Um, that's where like my first kind of like message with the recruiter was like on LinkedIn. And if it wasn't like my LinkedIn, I would not be hired, you know, mm -hmm. um, which a lot of people just go to the website. Anyway, it's just. That's good. Well, episode 32, uh, how to be a LinkedIn ninja. <laughs> oh, there you go. There but, you go. but okay. So in, if you want to talk about that for a second, I mean, um, how you initially got approached and also like, what do you think, what so, are some of the things that you think you did with LinkedIn that helped you get more visibility? Um, so it's, it's, again, it takes time, right? First of all, I put every single, I try to complete my LinkedIn a hundred percent, like put all information that they asked me for. The second thing is words is very sensitive to words. So like, um, I try to put every single thing that I worked um, and my skills, right? So if I, it's important to have their Maya or um, yeah, make yourself Max very searchable, or, like all the keywords. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So if the person is looking for a word, I'm sure they're gonna find my profile, right? Yeah. The other thing is that I start trying to every single I went to like SIGGRAPH and meetings and stuff and I actually met the recruiter in person one time and I got her card and I add her on my LinkedIn and as soon as I heard that Ireland was hiring, I sent her a message and that was before I went to Blur, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then I kept in touch with her. Hey, I'm on Pixelmondo right now. I'm doing this, this and that. And I, I would sometimes get no answer whatsoever but whatever. Um, then I went to Blur and like, hey, I started a Blur, like I just sending a message, you know, like what is going on? Do you have any, you know? And, and then after time you start, of course, you're not going to be a pain in the ass, you know, yeah. asking, you know, but you try to create like a relationship and try to become memorable, right? Exactly. Um, and that was all through LinkedIn. And then when the opportunity came and they have like an opening, she she sent me a message like, hey, we want to talk to you. Um, are you available? Can we talk on the phone? So I spoke with, on the phone with her and then I did an interview and there you go. And so the, the whole process took like eight months. Mm -hmm. you know? But that's good. I mean, that's like a really important thing I think most people don't get is that you got to look at the long term. You got to build those relationships, and and whether it's just one place or it's many places, you got to do that and not expect a result right away. And the thing is too is that yeah, you're you're absolutely right. You don't be harassy. You know, you don't keep saying hey, 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 what's up? But it is important to kind of keep that kind of um, you know keep it it fresh in their mind like who you are, so that way when it does you know be an opportunity, you respect the fact that they're busy, but. As long as they they're aware of who you are, then you know you're creating that opportunity, and it's really important. Yeah, and uh, keep it professional, keep it um, short, right? Because those people are usually like very busy, busy. Exactly. And, uh, yeah, and it's a lot of work. It's a lot of work. You have to answer a lot of emails. Be very, you know, um, responsive. Like right away. Don't like wait. You know, and. Mm -hmm. uh, and a lot of, like, I try many places. I tried Naughty Dog. I tried Blizzard. I try, you know, it's, um, I still have their contacts. I still, like, send message once in a while. And it's all about, like, networking. It's just like, creating, you know, um, making connections, you know. Mm -hmm. that's, that's what it is, you know. And if I came from Brazil and I make those connections, anybody can do it. There you go. 
Uh, and I'm just kind of curious, like, um, what was your interview experience like? You know, was it over the phone? Um, the first interview was more like just, I, I think I had Susumu. I, yeah, the first interview was very mild. It was very, uh, the second interview, they were like looking at my demo reel and making all those questions. And um, the big tip I can give to people is to be through to work. And because a, a lot of people know, like everybody knows each other. So if you haven't, if you haven't worked in something, don't say that you work on that thing. You know, yep. Yep. be very true for what you know. What you did in that scene, I did this, this, and that. You know, and yep. be very. So, oh, did you you do this map painting? No, no, that was another guy. I but I did this and this and that. Like, be very truthful for what you did. You know. Yeah, and humble too. Um, yeah, and yeah, you're right. Because I mean, that's one of the things too is that it's very easy. Like, you'll get some of this stuff like 2012 where everybody like you know, has it on their reel because everyone worked on 2012. And mm -hmm. um, so... That become kind of the joke on a Blur, right? <laughs> yeah, well, at a lot of places, I think, just because especially in Max, like um, a lot of the LA sequence was, you know, you'd have like 20, 30 people on a single shot and you'd have that on your reel. Uh, I know a lot of people did where, you know, you would look at that and you'd be like, oh, well, I thought so-and-so did that shot. And mm -hmm. if you're not clear specifically about what you did, then, you know, it's it's one of those things you just don't want to ever trigger any kind of warning bells in someone's head where they're like, oh, I don't know about this guy because I know so-and-so did that shot and mm -hmm. he's saying that he did it. So you got to be very clear, like, look, I did, you know, the dust or, or the fog or, you know, whatever, mm -hmm. the lens flare, you know. Um, if you're clear about that, you're distinguishing, you know, what you did and it makes you a lot more legit. And if you're just like, yeah, I did, every, did it all or you're not clear about it, it's it does kind of raise some alarms, which you know, can cause problems down the line. So mm -hmm. yeah, it's really important. That's good, man. I think that's really good advice to have. Yeah. Um, I think a lot of people would benefit from, and I don't know. I mean, you know, just kind of on that subject, I mean, I think for LinkedIn, I think that's like a, a really good, you know, thing to kind of touch on. Cause I still think a lot of people either don't understand, uh, how to use LinkedIn efficiently for what they're trying to do, or they just kind of imagine, okay, if I just get on LinkedIn, then, I'll get job offers every day and it's not the case at mm -hmm. all. It's, it's about being proactive. Yeah. It's not, it's, yeah, you're not going to get, um, yeah, it's not uh, uh, like it sounds cause as an artist, you think like, Oh, it, but you know, my portfolio is what like sales my work. Yeah, it does. But I try to understand like, I, and it's, it's funny because when I first came to, you know, we are artists, we don't look at LinkedIn, but we are dealing with HR people, right? So HR right. people are very um, business driven and LinkedIn is what they are used to. And you want to make sure that you're doing your right work. You know, like cover letter, for example, I see a lot of people like writing like very badly writing cover letters. And I really try to do my best, even if the person don't look or ignore my cover letter it's there if they look it's going to be good and it's know? the first thing that they will look at and it kind of um d describes like for for me i look at a lot of reels and i'm you know i'm not gonna click on someone's reel unless i, I know what you know whether or not it's, it's worth my time and like mm -hmm. it's more about you you just need to understand that people are busy and if you're looking mm -hmm. at a lot of reels you need to kind of set the tone. You need to do a lot of things. And the cover letter is yeah. a really good way to be able to set exactly what, you know, it's, it's kind of like if, if you're about to watch a movie and the, the first five minutes is really going to set the tone of like what you're watching and whether, you know, you're prepared for it or whether you don't give a shit. And yeah. if you are able to, in the first paragraph, say, okay, like this is who I am. Because like if, if you don't even make it clear exactly what you are like if you say i'm a generalist but you don't really go into specifics about whether you're doing lighting or environments or everything then they start looking at a reel they're like well i don't know what you did uh so what am i looking for here um you know so if you're you're able to make it all clear and paint the image mm -hmm. in your head and you know, I, um one thing that i'm going to add is like you need to tailor your every time you apply to a place i always tailored my cover letter my not a cover letter is obvious but like my resume right mm -hmm. and yeah. my demo reel depending on the place that it would apply i actually would change my demo reel just for that place because if i'm applying for a lighting position 
they don't want to see models and you know or you know effects tasks that I did like they or animation they want to see lighting. Yeah. So I would tailor my demo reel to apply to that position, right? And I think it's very important because I yes I do have a general demo reel that I keep on my website, but I would I would create like several demo reels for like specific positions. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I think it's really good to say it. And, you know, that's not always going to be the case, but um, I do think if you're in a position where you can do that, then, yeah, mm -hmm. you know, you want to make the biggest impact possible. And, and, and of course, if, depending on the company, right? Like, if you're working for, like, commercials and, like... You want to like, show everything. Yeah, you want to show everything. I'm saying for, like, applying for Pixar for animation, like, don't show... The blood and the guts and... The <laughs> yeah, right? So you need to... Yeah. You got yeah. it. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but that's good. I mean, and the thing is too is that I always say it's, it's better to have not shown enough than to have shown too much. And, mm -hmm. you know, in that situation, like you can always say, this is specifically my lighting reel, but if you're interested in seeing, you know, more of my work, you can check out my other reels on my site. And um, yeah. that way it's like, okay, well, we can go check out more stuff. And ha knowing other areas is great, but yeah, you want to specifically t tailor it to what you're going for so that way you're selling them on it they're like holy shit okay we need someone for this position and this guy or girl is exactly who we need mm -hmm. so um and good. and ask for feedback like it's um it's surprising how they're actually responsive in that like if you ask like hey so what do you guys think I, i'm looking for like honest feedback and they will give you the feedback like yeah this this is good but you need to work on this area you need to and and listen to their saying you know because if you're really trying to go to that place, follow that feedback yep. and it works. You know, the, Those are two really, really important points. I call that an open thread. In other words, when you email someone, if you kind of leave the conversation open with like, by the way, like, you know, I would love to get your feedback. You guys do amazing work and, you know, maybe I'm not the right person for, for this job, but uh, I would definitely appreciate two seconds of your mm -hmm. time. And what it means is that A, you're humble and approachable and, you know, all that stuff. But it also means that um, you're leaving the conversation open for them to reply rather than like, okay, cool, we'll put it on file. You know, you're leaving them a chance to email you back and start that relationship, which we were just talking about, you know. Mm -hmm. So I think that's really important. And um, also showing them the initiative by saying, hey, um, I, I took your advice. Because I think that's the most important thing. You can, if people give you advice and you're like, okay, great, whatever, um, it, it really kind of just creates this big disconnect. But if you say, I took your advice and I, I changed this stuff, like, what do you think? Then suddenly you're you're creating this like kind of mentorship, mentee relationship. And at the same time, they show that you're you're willing to take direction and, and that you can take direction. And when you're being hired, especially for the first time, that's one of the biggest gambles is can this person actually take direction? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I think it's great. Really good don't, advice. Yeah, don't. You see a lot of young, but I see a lot of young guys, and it, it, this I think this you you get with experience, right? Mm -hmm. Once you start a job, dude, like my job at ILM, I'm doing what they want, right? I'm, we're all working for a client, right? Yeah. Um, yeah, I I might think that this shot would be better. This I might propose, like, hey, why shouldn't we? But in the end of the day, I'm doing what the client wants, mm -hmm. and you know, that's it. You're you're yeah. paid to go and make something. So if and they want to, yeah, if they want a pink elephant, then you give them a pink elephant. Yeah, and um, some people, I know some people that get really offended with that. Even like in, when I was back in Brazil, they get really offended because it's like, well, but we are artists and stuff. And yeah, I agree, but it's uh, um, it's part of the job, right? We're doing something for our client, like. Yeah. Um, yeah, man, don't argue with people. Don't do that. That was, yeah, I, I, I think I mentioned it a few times, but I remember at ILM, I the, one of the first dailies I went to with um, Dennis Murin, and yeah, there was someone in there who was talking back, um, you know, when, when he's being given direction, he's kind of talking back like, hey, well, you don't get it. The reason I did this is because of this. And it's kind of like, okay, like, you know, your supervisor's telling you he wants changes, and also... He's someone who probably knows what he wants because he's been, you know, one of the key people who pretty much invented visual effects. So mm -hmm. maybe you should, you know, write it down and say, okay, I got it. 
So uh, yeah, I, uh, I just I interviewed Fred Ruff, I think the last episode, and um, he made a good point, um, or second last episode about you know not pushing back on your notes. In other words, like people give you feedback, then you say yes, and if you have some great way to add to it, awesome. But mm -hmm. just saying like no, I don't want to make changes, or you know you're an idiot and I'm right and you're wrong, then that's never going to work out well for you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, that's why I think it's also important. And it, it was really good and part of my life. I actually was working as a freelancer, like uh, dealing straight with the client. And I think you learn a lot after you do that because you understand that in the, in the end of the day, you're doing stuff for money, right? It's, it's the money involved. Like you have a, an amount of time to do that and there's a, an amount of money to do that. And, you know, how much... How much can we do effective, mm -hmm. effectively with that money and that time, right? Um, so, yeah, I just, I, I don't know, man. Like, I feel if I really need to do something artistic, I make time and I come home and I do it, mm -hmm. you know? Um, a friend of mine, actually from Luma, um, he, he told me, like, hey, if you want to do your stuff, like, wake up a little early, do your stuff. Do your art, you know, create, and then go to your job and do what other people want, you know. And yep. you're, yeah. You're there to provide a service for someone else's vision, not yours. And, mm -hmm. uh, you know, down the line, maybe that will change. But, uh, yeah, I mean, I think it's important because at least the big benefit is if you're easy to cooperate with, if people feel mm -hmm. like, yeah, like they, this person listens, they make changes, they do everything I ask them to do that's going to keep you around. Um, yeah. The more that you are able to work with a team and be able to just follow direction, the more people will want to work with you more. And of course, it's not like I, you know, I, I want to make the shot because like, I have the mentality that if I do good work on my shot, I can actually present that shot later on and that will give me more work, right? Mm -hmm. yep. So it's not like I don't want to make the shot look like awesome. I do, but you need to pick your battles you can't like be fighting for you know exactly otherwise you know nobody's gonna go anywhere so yeah that's good and i'm kind of curious like where do you want to go like long term i mean do you have any um i want to go to your apartment and play pinball <laughs> no uh, oh uh, arcade arcade yeah. yeah i was just talking about it this morning i was like because i haven't had a chance to I, I i'm not neglecting it i every day i, I bought this arcade machine and uh, every day I look at it, I'm like, I want to play it. I just don't have time and I'm trying to find time. So one of these days you and me will be going to be playing double dragon. It's going to yeah. be great. But <laughs> when, when I go there, I want to be playing for like an amount of hour, like a crazy amount of hour. I don't want to be and get drunk. Oh yeah. Beer, yeah. cachaça and pizza. <laughs> no, no diet for us. Sure. An ice cream. <laughs> Delcio and I used to go for ice cream walks, which... Again, you're you're such a big guy, and like the the two of us, like walking down the street eating ice cream, uh, little ice cream cones <laughs> through Culver pink, City. Yeah, pink ice cream. <laughs> Not quite, but <laughs> yeah, I'm sure it was a bit of an image. Because it's um, yeah, another thing that I because I think are you like kind of because a lot of people um, there's like. I don't. I don't want to say that there is only two kind of people. There is like all kind of people, but ice cream people uh, and non-ice yeah. cream. Yeah, no. Some people. I'm. I'm a, a guy who I work on boosts, right? So I work for like for two hours. Yeah. I'm really into it, and then I need a break. I need to walk out of the computer, walk around, and it was good that you were around because I feel like you also would go out with me. You know. Yeah. We tried yeah, to schedule that. it. Like you would say, yeah. "Hey, let's go," and I, you know, we'd be like, "Okay, thirty minutes." Um, I did that a lot, especially at Blur. I was setting um, designated hours of time. So let's mm -hmm. say I do three times a day where I say, "Okay, these this is going to be a two-hour burst of work where I would not have email, I would not have chat, my phone would be on, um, do not disturb, and it would just be these focused amounts of time where you know I wouldn't talk, I wouldn't do anything, and." Um, then you know, the rest of the time, if people wanted to 
come by my desk and hang out, fine, you know, I can do that and work. But if I had those designated times, it meant I could really concentrate. And I think that's really effective for everyone to, to have those. And most people don't. They allow everyone else to come in. And the cool thing is that if you do that, then you actually create times where you can say, hey, let's all go at three o'clock and we'll go get a coffee or whatever. Mm -hmm. And you kind of, anytime someone comes by, you say, well, I'm going at three to grab a coffee with these other people. So you start to kind of tie everyone into that social point. So you kind of delegate your day a little bit to um, to get yeah. more done. Yeah, yeah, and I think, I think it's important to have breaks, you know. It's important to like yeah. breathe some air, like walk around, you know. Hug and, a tree. Uh, yeah, <laughs> and, uh, and then get back, you know, to work. And yeah, you're right. And schedule those. Uh, yeah, don't and let it like, don't let, and when you focus, you focus, right? You don't yeah. let anything else like disturb you. But then once you walk away, you know, there's like, yeah, it's kind of like, I kind of like describe kind of like sleeping. You have like the really deep sleeping and then you come out and then you go back. Or, That's right. Yeah. yeah. That's <laughs> sleepwalking. Um, yeah. But it, it is true. Like, uh, and that way you feel, you, you can kind of justify taking that bit of break because mm -hmm. I think that it helps your productivity to step away. And like most of the time um, that I, I do step away from the computer, like, you know, even going and sitting on a couch for a little bit, I'm thinking about a shot and I come back and I have clarity. But if you're in the trenches, like you're just busy doing work for the sake of doing work, you're not necessarily approaching it from the right way. So I think it's very important to to step away and come back. Yeah, and if, if you're hitting the wall, you know, like if you can't like make something work, like step away, Yeah. maybe ask questions to someone, you know, try to see the solution in a, in a different, like look outside of the box, you know, try to... And sometimes it comes to you or you find another way and you keep going, you know? Yeah, so. absolutely. And that's the thing. You, you could be staring at something for a really long time and not even know what you're, uh, you feel about it anymore. Mm -hmm. um, I've got a friend of mine. I'm actually going to have him on the podcast the next week or two. He just finished a short film, which is coming out this week. And um, it's really, really awesome. And, uh, yeah, that's the thing is he wasn't quite sure what to um, – what what to think of it because he's been staring at it for so long uh it's the dawn of the planet of the zombies and the giant killer <laughs> plants uh <laughs> short film it's it's freaking amazing um he, he just finished it uh last night and he sent me like a preview of it and uh yeah it's it's amazing and the thing is that like i totally get it you you look at something for so long you're like okay is it good or is it bad because i can't tell anymore mm -hmm. so getting a fresh pair of eyes to look at your work and say yeah you should do this or that like i think it's very valuable yeah, and that's why I um, I don't do that all the time. But I learn. I think it was actually Chris Costa who taught me that. He um, when I'm working, when if let's say I have two different tasks, right? Mm -hmm. I try to. A lot of people and I used to do that a lot. I used to like focus on one task and then like for a day or so, like for many hours, and then go to the other task. When I have multiple tasks, I try to do a little bit. And grow them at the same time, you know. So I like I block something out here, I block something out in another task, you know. Yep. And it's a good tip for people who are like making personal work. They're like um, sometimes you get tired of like looking at the same thing over and over again. Working on another project, like do two projects at the same time, you know, and um, it helps because then when you go back to the A B A B, when you go back to A. You look different. It, it, you know, oh, yeah, this this is not correct. Let me change this. You know, yeah. I, I like it's probably not something to everybody, but I really like to do this way. I prefer yeah. actually. I'm doing like uh, typically I do a, between three to five projects at once, and it's just because I freelance and I work remotely, I can do that. And for me, that's exactly how I'm able to do it. Because if you're on one project, I honestly think that. The project's going to go for as long as it's going, you know, as long as you have on it. And mm -hmm. most of the time, like especially if we're at the office, like we're we're working on something, we submit it to a render, we you know dick around. Like things take a lot longer just because you know you've got nothing else to do. But um, mm -hmm. if if you have multiple things and you can fire that stuff off to, off to the farm, switch gears to the next project, you work on that for a bit. When you kind of hit that wall where you need to step away. You fire that to the farm. You swap back to the other one again, and that way you kind of like uh, treading water the whole time. It's a really efficient way of working. Yeah, yeah, I agree. That's good, man. And um, yeah, like I, I got to come up to San Fran at some point, I think, and uh, hang out with you guys. So yeah. I think that's what you're final final. God no, um, pick and whistle. Let me give you some car bombs. 
Oh, God. Yeah, I'm actually going to Vegas with uh, Dan Rorty. Uh, he's on my podcast. He works um, on... He was around here, right? Back then. Oh, shit. Yeah, you're right. He was, uh, he was next door at um, LucasArts. Yeah. yeah. I, so. I met him online. I never actually met him in person. I, I spoke to him through the through Facebook and stuff. Right. Yeah. He's he's a really good guy. I've like you know yeah. I've known him like all over the place. And um, yeah, he's flying out for Fourth of July. We're going to go to Vegas and go crazy. And uh, we're we're just talking about Jello shots and <laughs> everything else that we're planning to do out there. So, but yeah, car bombs and some wasabi or something sounds like a plan. Can I show up? <laughs> sure, man. If you want to come. <laughs> Um, but yeah, man, this has been great. I mean, it's just been fun to kind of hang out because it's like I said, I haven't spoken to you since yeah. you you went to uh, to ILM, so it's kind of been good to kind of catch up. And um, I might have to come up there, and you know, especially because there's so many people I know at ILM right now. So just be a good family reunion, I think for for all of us. Yeah, um, yeah, just stop by, man. I'm pretty sure you 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 probably not gonna be interested in doing the the whole tour thing, right? It's just going to be, you know, straight oh. to the bar, right? Uh, unless I want some free food from the, the kitchen or something. <laughs> um, actually, I, I will say that. Like, that's one thing I loved about ILM was that it's one of the, the very few offices I've worked at where every day you, it's kind of like you walk around. It's just cool to see all the um, the maquettes and all the statues and all the yep. other cool on-set stuff. So, I mean, it's just – it's cool. Like, it's – you know, there's never a day where you don't appreciate that. Um I love the fact that they got that um, Vigo or whatever the Ghostbusters two painting. Mm-hmm. Um, you know the one I'm talking about, right? It's on level yeah, three. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's if you go to level one in the kitchen side, I think um, they've got another one of it. Like I was with Carlos and Guiano, and we're walking around doing our you know ice cream walks without the ice cream. And uh, yeah, like um, I noticed they've got two of the same Ghostbusters painting. So I guess they had like two versions that are identical uh, when they're doing the movie. Which I thought was kind of funny. Yeah, I found the the first one, the the one on the fifth floor. But yeah, I'll look yep. for that one on the first floor. Mm. That's the basement. I never go there, man. <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, you know, when you run out of space, you got to go somewhere. <laughs> yeah. No, uh, and it's cool. They they have like um, I managed to see like Mad Max. I managed to see Tomorrowland. They have like the screenings, you know. Yeah. It's pretty cool. Like they have like a really comfortable and nice theater there, and. Um, it is awesome, you know, and it's very like um, it's very overwhelming when you're doing dailies on that theater, you know. Yeah, like, yeah. It's very overwhelming. Like you, you can hear the the echo of your voice. It's, yeah, it's a little too quiet in there. <laughs> yeah, I, I kind of like, don't want to go in there by myself. <laughs> yeah, it's like you know, and it's cool when you're like in the like Avengers, like in the beginning. I was in the very beginning, and there was only five people in that theater, and you're like. You know, you walk in, you start talking, and you hear your voice, and that like it's um, overwhelming, <laughs> especially when you first start. You know? Yeah, it was awesome. Enough. Like a lot of people, a lot of tourists, like every day on on the Yoda fountain and asking mm-hmm. to take photos. One one of my like I think on the second week I was actually walking from the 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 fountain, and I was walking in, and this um, lady, like probably like forty something. She came to me and like, hey, you work here? And I'm like, yeah. Um, how much? And I'm like, what? How much what? How much for you to make me a tour? And like, nah, it doesn't work like that, man. Like, I'm sorry, I can't. No, I, ju- I just want to go to the store. And I'm like, nah, I'm sorry, security, <laughs> please. It's awkward. Did you like, did you hear about that? That um, uh, what was it? There was a person who was charging like um, out on eBay. They were selling essentially tickets to come get tours of ILM and they're oh, yeah um, how much it cost I don't know it's, it's, like, it's like 50 bucks or something like um, I remember uh, someone was telling me that like when I was there um, but they were giving it away to charity so it wasn't exactly like they were trying to cash oh, in okay. it but at the same time like you're not allowed to do that and um, yeah so they were actually trying to sell tickets so you could come and get a tour but um, yeah. it's you know. um when I first started I first started there, like someone, I, f- I forgot who it was, but told me that the, that place is not only a company, but it has like a feel of a museum, mm-hmm. sure. you know, such kind of thing. And also kind of like uh, uh, because of, probably because of the campus, how like 
you know, has the nice outside area and stuff. It reminds you like a university, right? Yeah. And sure. you have all the classes and stuff. So it's kind of a blend between a university, a museum, and a, a business place, you know? Yeah, it's it's definitely got a lot of history to it, and you know it's yeah. I mean, you know, you walk around, you see celebrities in the um, in the gift store buying like a, a cool little T shirt or or a book or whatever. And especially yeah. especially now with the Star, the whole Star Wars coming, um, yeah, yeah. There's a lot of people there, man, just taking photos with Yoda. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, when I was there, someone, um, I think it was an employee, but uh, I'm not sure. If, uh, 100% sure, but like we were working one weekend on Airbender and Iron Man, and um, someone like made the, the the fountain foam, so it started like it was all foaming and overflowing, and uh, <laughs> yeah, so I don't know, like it was a really big deal at the time. I was like, you know, people were not happy about it, but yeah, it was like it was foaming and overflowing everywhere. The Yoda, you know, <laughs> in the middle of it all. So, funny. so yeah. you work on that Iron Man. Uh, I I didn't I worked on the last Airbender, which okay. um, probably yeah. has like the worst like at, at least when I was there it was the mm, the the messiest kind of project I think in history just because it was a pretty <laughs> overwhelming uh, project and it kind of changed direction many times so um, yeah I, but you know a lot of guys were on Iron Man two like James Bennett Carl Singiano. Um, they were both on Iron Man 2 um, working on that, which, again, like, that was changing directions a lot of the time as well. So, mm -hmm. um, yeah, so, I don't know. It was it was interesting. I was originally meant to go there for Transformers 2, and a, at the time, what had been offered to me was more of an effects lead position. And mm -hmm. that, the, the only, probably the only thing in my entire career I ever regret is turning that down because um, I basically, the way I justified it was that I was in Vancouver and I'd been to California a thousand times. I'd never been to Europe and I got offered to go work on 2012 in Europe. And I ended up taking a job in, um, in Berlin, which ended up being like the, the biggest nightmare project I've ever experienced mm -hmm. in my life. And it took me six months to get over it. Um, it's just, yeah, I burned out big time and it was just a disaster. And Meanwhile, like this other job would have been so great. And I kind of feel like when I did go to ILM, I was still burned out from um, that project. So because it was the next project I did. And um, I don't know. So it was, it was interesting. Um, first time I ever spoke to ILM, they called me out, out of the blue. I was in Australia and I got a random call. And um, I think it was Laurie or yeah, I think one of the girls. And like, she, she was just like, hey, like, you know, are you interested in coming to work for ILM? And I was really hung over. Um, I really, it, always. it was the, it was one of the worst times to call me. And like, I, I could not even put words together. So she basically did the whole pitch about like, Hey, we're calling from L uh, from, from San Fran. Like we want you to come to ILM. Are you interested? And the only word I could get out was no, <laughs> because I was so hungover and she was like, Oh, okay. So, uh, I made sure to get her email address though and follow up and apologize. But yeah. Um, and then my job now, now tell your listeners like do not do that. Yeah, Don't. do do not do that. <laughs> uh, yeah, it was just the worst timing ever. Is one of those like yeah, probably not the best best time to answer the phone is when you're feeling like crap and uh, yeah. you don't recognize the number. But um, yeah, so you know, um, Iron Man two and Airbender. I mean, at the time like Plume had just come out, which was yeah. their um, you know their software for doing fluids, and it was kind of cool just going to see them. Um, developing that and kind of seeing all the groundbreaking stuff they were doing so yeah. yeah and i'm sorry man like i'm trying to talk about ilm but i'm i honestly don't know how much can i talk about especially like tools and stuff you know yep. i'm yep. being very like because i'm you know i don't have the permission no well you know uh, anything i'm mentioning is all public knowledge and everything you've mentioned is um you know all general stuff anyway so i mean you're not saying anything uh, crazy but um no, it's good. I mean, I think that, you know, with anywhere, especially somewhere that is a pretty public company, I mean, it's good to be respectful of, um, you know, what you can and can't say. So, no, it's good. And, uh, and, totally and understand. Me, man, a lot of times I know I know stuff that's only coming to the theater in a, in a couple of months and I'm like, oh, shit, I want to tell someone. Or, yeah. You know, I can't. Like, yeah, I, I would love to pick your brain about that yeah. project but um yeah another, and i'm glad august I'm glad, for example, you haven't asked anything about star wars like and you know 
we are not supposed to talk about it. It's like, you know, kind of like Fight Club kind of thing. <laughs> the first rule of Star Wars is you do not talk about it. Not talk about it. Yeah. Um, it's, it's, it's been, I, I guess I can say that, it's been such a secret project that even internally, it's a secret. You know what I mean? One or two things I'll just quickly add to it. Like, you know, if, if there was someone who wanted to target like a bigger place like Weta, ILM, um, what would be some key advice you would say if you wanted to, you know, stand out or find a way to get the upper hand when, when going to a place like that? I don't know, man. I guess like be nice to people, I guess. Don't be a dick. I guess that would be my, my big, yeah. Cause you know, nobody likes people who are very, I think be humble, you know, mm-hmm. don't, don't, don't walk the room and, and you know, it's only for ILM and big companies. I guess it's for every company, right? Mm-hmm. You don't want you don't want to have to deal with someone who thinks they know the shit, you know. And even if you know the shit, be humble. It's like it's impressive. Sometimes you actually learn. You learn a lot from people who are like very junior that just mm-hmm. came out of school and stuff. But maybe, maybe they had access to a new technology that you haven't heard of yet, you know. Yep. So just be humble, like be open to cheat, teach and people will teach you too. And you, you know, it's a big group of like learning, you know, and that's what I like. That's what I'm passionate about, you know, I'm very curious and I like to learn and I like to teach also and show what I know and you show me what you know and, you know, and get ice cream when we have <laughs> time. It's all about the ice cream. Yeah. Cool, man. Uh, this is great. It's uh, good to talk to you, man, and thank you. Um, but yeah, uh, let's let's catch up soon. I'll come up to San Fran and we'll get some ice cream and some beer. Yeah, looking <laughs> forward. Thanks thank for you. thanks for the opportunity, man. Like, uh, really appreciate. It, it was wow. a good talk. Thank you, brother. All right, so that was really awesome. I'd love to get your comments and feedback about this interview. So if you want to go to www.alanmckay.com slash thirty eight, so the number three eight. And I'd love to hear uh, what you thought and anything you want to say to Delcio. I'm sure he'd love to hear as well. Lastly, as I mentioned before, you can check out the real review coming up on June 16. If you go to almckay.com slash real review, R-E-E-L review, and that will be something really, really awesome. So again, uh, next episode is going to be an interview with Alf Martin Lavold, and that's on his new short film trailer um, that is just come out today and you can check that out in the show notes. Uh, and that's it. So thanks again for listening and I'll be back soon.